Welcome to worship here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church on Palm Sunday. It's Thursday when we're recording this, and I see on Sunday there's a 90% chance of rain, but there is a 100% chance that we will be there to bless these palms and get Holy Week started. The next worship opportunity for Holy Week will be on Maundy Thursday with a live stream service at 7.30. For Good Friday, we'll have a pre-recorded service that will go out to you, including the reading of the Passion according to St. Mark. And then on Easter, we will offer continuous worship around the garden entrance from 9 a.m. to noon. The service will include the full liturgy, preaching, strings, trumpets, singing, and we will worship the risen Christ. Don't forget your masks for those outdoor gatherings. Come and go whenever you please. Stay as little or as long as you like. Just as on Christmas Eve, many will choose to stand throughout, but you may bring a chair as well to be comfortable. Today, for this worship video, be sure to stick around to the end of the video to enjoy a special organ postlude by director of music, Adam Bergstresser. Be sure to see what socks he might be wearing. It's a thing for organists, so <laughs> check that out. Now, let us join in worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We all warm to affection and praise, and I'm sure Jesus warmed to the outburst of affection he received from the crowd on that first Palm Sunday. Andrew Weber and Tom Rice captured the spirit of that day in their rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the crowd sings, Christ, you know I love you. Did you see I waved? I believe in you and God, so tell me that I'm saved. Growing up in Galilee, Jesus was a strange and enigmatic figure. His father died young, and Jesus followed in his father's footsteps in the family's carpentry shop. Then in his late 20s, he began to teach and preach, and his words had incredible depth and power. He became something of a celebrity. It all came to a peak on Palm Sunday as he crested the hill on that donkey. What evoked such affection and passion? Sam Miller, the late dean of Harvard Divinity School, once wrote that perhaps the most neglected image of Jesus is that of a bridegroom. It's not an uncommon word. Weddings are still a big deal in most societies, but today is Palm Sunday, and whereas we often refer to Jesus as a king, a prophet, a priest, son of man, son of God, physician, friend, shepherd, Jesus as bridegroom is an image we often neglect. But here he comes, cresting the hill, Christ the bridegroom wooing his beloved, the archetypal Prince Charming looking for sleeping beauty to rescue her from the dragon. Here comes Christ the romantic, cresting the hill on that lowly beast out to win the whole human race. Why did people respond with such affection, with shouts of unbridled praise and adoration? Well, first they felt neglected. The power people neglected them. I don't know that there is a blow harder to handle than the blow of neglect. 
I think of a minister who served the church in Texas and one Sunday after church, he heard crying in the nave. He followed the cry and found in the pew an eight-year-old boy crying his heart out. The minister knew Benjamin. He lived a mile away in an orphan's home and they brought the children each Sunday as they did to this church years ago from the Tabor home down on South 611. They brought the children each Sunday, but the woman who drove the van was careless with her head count and she drove away without Benjamin. They forgot me, Benjamin told the minister through his tears, they forgot me. Benjamin was wounded at the deepest place ignored, neglected. Is there anything harder to handle than this? I've been watching a lot of basketball lately. After all, it's March Madness. I wonder how many of these players whose skills we admire, I wonder how many were neglected at home. And then a coach came and saw great talent and cared for them, not just because they had skill with a basketball, but cared for them as flesh and blood human beings, desperate for someone to care about them, care about them for who they are and not just for what they could do on the basketball court. I've been watching the Lincoln documentary. I'm sure many of you have, A Nation Divided. Lincoln lost his mother when he was nine and his father just took off to find another wife. And there was Abe, nine years old, in the care of his 11-year-old sister. And Tom was a distant father. Lincoln's mother was bright and intellectually curious and loving and caring, but not Tom. What a hurdle faced young Abe. Talk about neglect. The other night I was watching this show on television, The Good Doctor, I love this show. In this latest episode, a renowned surgeon comes to the hospital, his hand shakes, and he wants this life-threatening operation on his brain. This surgeon has no friends, no family, all he has is his career. Finally, he breaks down and comes clean. He tells Sean, the young autistic surgeon in the show, he tells Sean that his father died when he was nine, his father was loving and compassionate, and when his father died, well, his mother was cold and distant. And this surgeon in his 60s, he now says that as long as he can remember, as long as he can remember, all he poured himself into was his job. Emotional neglect has, had been his experience ever since his father died and he was a young boy. The poet Robert Frost understood the human predicament when he wrote in his poem, Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. But the good news of this day is that for all who feel the fire and ice of neglect, there comes cresting the hill on his donkey, Christ the bridegroom, the archetypal Prince Charming, looking for us sleeping beauties, intent on rescuing us from the dragon of neglect. Ah, but there were others on that first Palm Sunday who didn't feel so much neglect as they felt exploited. The power people of the day had an interest in them, all right, but it was a utilitarian interest. There's so much of that in our world, sexual exploitation, financial exploitation. Brooke Reinhardt thought she had it made. Married less than a year to a man who was very successful, her future looked bright indeed. Then one morning at 6 a.m., the FBI showed it up her house and arrested her. She had never even gotten a speeding ticket, and suddenly she's in handcuffs in her mismatched pajamas and hauled away. The charges? Wire fraud and mail fraud. You can Google this, you can look it up. It was her husband. 
He used her identity to embezzle tens of thousands of dollars from his workplace. In an instant, not even out of her pajamas at six in the morning, her life was suddenly in shambles. In a word, she had been exploited, betrayed by the one she loved the most. Arthur Miller in one of his plays says, why is betrayal the only truth that sticks? I understand one out of every four women in this country has experienced physical and emotional abuse, and this pandemic has only made things worse. Abuse is surely one of the consequences of this COVID epidemic. In many parts of the world, the statistics are even more tragic. Some of our young people have been in places like Cambodia, and they've told of how sex trafficking has become a universal problem in the world. Nicholas Kristof writes about it often. I can never understand why he doesn't suffer from compassion fatigue. He has gone into the heart of this problem and tried to expose it and correct it. Talk about exploitation. C.S. Lewis once distinguished need love from gift love. Gift love is when I love you for what you are. Need love is when I love you for what you can do for me. I need you because I love you, that's mature. I love you because I need you, that's immature love. To be used and discarded, what a terrible experience that is. Who gives much thought to a Kleenex after it's used? Well, those who gathered on the first Palm Sunday, they knew this Kleenex experience. They knew what it was to be used and exploited. But the good news of Palm Sunday is that cresting the hill on his donkey comes Christ the bridegroom, the archetypal Prince Charming, who comes looking for us sleeping beauty so he can awaken us, help us believe in ourselves, to know we have worth because he loves us, and then become what we were meant to be. Ah, but there were still others on that first Palm Sunday, not only the neglected ones, not only the exploited ones, but those who were criticized and condemned. How hard it is to be around people who look at you as if you don't matter. Former Governor Devin Patrick of Massachusetts tells in his memoir of a terrible day in his life. He was only four. His parents got in a terrible fight in their Chicago tenement and his father left. Devin ran after his dad. His father said, go home. But Devin kept chasing him. His father turned and slapped him and ran away. It took another 20 years before the two were reconciled. Devin says his teacher saved him. They believed in him. He got a scholarship to Milton Prep School, then Harvard College and Harvard Law School. How desperately we all need someone to believe in us. So it was on that first Palm Sunday. Imagine the utter astonishment when cresting the hill on his donkey comes a person of power who, in the words of St. Augustine, cared for each as if there were none other and loved all as he loved each. He did not look through them as if they were plates of glass. He looked at them as if they were people of grandeur. You see, Jesus saw imperfection as an apprenticeship. Perfection was not a prerequisite for having a relationship with him. Rather, perfection was a goal out there ahead to which everyone was striving. So often we say to God, Lord, if I change, if I improve, you will love me, won't you? And the Lord's reply is always, wait a minute, you've got it wrong. You don't have to improve, so I'll love you. I love you, so you'll improve. Those who were down and condemned, they gathered there on that first Palm Sunday 
looking upon themselves as a bride who was being looked on by a bridegroom. And suddenly, out of the blue, Prince Charming has come into their lives and sensed a beauty and a worth in them he wanted to awaken. That is why in that first Palm Sunday, when they saw him crest the hill, there welled up such a crescendo of praise and affection. And so today he comes to us as the archetypal Prince Charming to help us see that we are unaware of our beauty. It was John Claypool, that wonderful Southern preacher who helped me get this image off dead center, introduced me to this image by Samuel Miller. Claypool once said, you don't have to clean yourselves up and then God will love you. God loves you and that is where you get the power to clean yourselves up. The reason there was such passion and delight on that first Palm Sunday is because the one who crested the hill was he who claimed to be the bridegroom. And if ever we could sense that Prince Charming comes from the very heart of God and we are sleeping beauties, then we could awaken to the love that is already ours. We are indeed the bride, the apple of his eye, the object of his delight. If ever we recognize who Jesus is, then we too will say with astonishment, Hosanna, Prince Charming. He is coming in the name of the Lord, and the name of the Lord is love. Ride on, King Jesus, ride on, ride on into our nation, ride on into my heart. Let us pray. O Lord, who on this day bowed your meek head to mortal pain, riding straight into the power of the enemy to suffer and die, give us the courage to follow you when it would be easier not to follow you. Give us courage to confront power with suffering love, thus showing your glory and grace to a bruised and broken world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O oh God, as we try to follow our Lord into the city where he was hailed as a king, help us to show forth in our lives something of his incomparable spirit, more ready to serve than be served, losing our lives to find them, 
Despite all our doubts, false starts, and broken promises, give us the stamina to follow steadily in his train on to the cross and to life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O thou who art our light and our salvation, give us, even in these problem-ridden days, the wit and will and faith to praise your holy name. Loose the hosannas that stick in our sophisticated throats. Overrule the pride that makes us too rigid for a good parade. Let the child in each of us come alive again that we may strew our well-pressed garments in the pathway of the King. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we pray for those in need and name them before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those whom we have loved and lost. They are still so dear to us. Hear us as we remember them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these words, however broken, we offer you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.